Now that exam number one is behind us, it looks like we are on lecture number eight. And I suppose a good place to start is to see where you are. And according to this, you are here. You are here at the transition between direct current and alternating current, which is going to lead to three phase power and motors and generators. As far as the transition is concerned, we are going to take many tools with us. We'll certainly keep Ohm's law, of course, KVL and KCL, energy and power, mesh and nodal, and things like the voltage and current divider rules. and some of your favorites like Thevenin and Norton. These are all the tools that you learned to manipulate direct current circuits. You'll be glad to know that they are exactly the same tools you'll use for alternating current. You could think of this class as a layered class where you learn a concept at DC and then you learn to apply that concept to AC and sometime later, again, to three-phase power. And all of those concepts also apply to motors and generators. This particular lecture will be pretty short. I wanted to talk about horsepower. And then we'll talk about inductors and capacitors. So topic one and topic two. Horsepower. If you wanted a technical definition of horsepower, we could talk about a pulley. We would talk about a weight, so 550 pound weight to be specific. And we would lift that weight, and we would lift by pulling this rope at a rate of one foot in one second. Okay, that is one way to talk about horsepower. Another way to talk about horsepower is to say that one horsepower is equal to 746 watts. And this is going to be very useful for us because as we make this transition, right, as we move from AC to three phase over to motors and generators, we're going to find that horsepower becomes very important to us. But yet, here in the AC world, in the DC world, we are talking about kilowatts. So at some point, we need a way of equating these two. It turns out that that equation works for us quite nicely. For instance, if you had a motor, we'll let this be a 200 horsepower motor. Using dimensional analysis, we would say 200 horsepower. And we would say there are 746 watts per horsepower. We'll go one more step and say that a kilowatt is 1,000 watts. Now, if we use dimensional analysis, horsepower cross out, watts cross out, and we are left with kilowatts. So that particular motor is 200 times 746 divided by 1,000. That gives us 149 kW. 200 horsepower is equal to 149 kW. I believe we've mentioned that energy is the product of power and time. Energy, of course, is the amount of work that's done. And power, so far we've defined that as the product of a current and a voltage or as I squared R, or as the voltage squared divided by the resistance. But you could see that we could also describe power as horsepower. So when we talk about energy, up to this point we've always talked about kilowatt hours, but we could just as easily talk about horsepower hours, or joules 
or watt seconds or BTUs or any number of other conversions. However, for our purposes, we'll talk about energy as the horsepower hour or the kilowatt hour. Let's go back to this motor and let's ask ourselves a question. Interesting question, isn't it? Well, I think we've suggested the answer already. We would say that energy is equal to the product of power and time. We could talk about power as 200 horsepower, but that's not very convenient because chances are when you purchase electricity, it's going to cost or it's going to be sold on the basis of the kilowatt hour. You might pay 12 cents per kilowatt hour. That 200 horsepower is not very convenient. However, we do have this number here. So we could say that energy is equal to 149 kilowatts by the amount of time. So that's three months. We'll assume a 30 day month by 24 hours. So we're going to have units of kilowatt hours here. So 149 times 3 times 30 times 24. So our energy is 322,000 kilowatt hours. To determine the cost, we take that number, so 322,000 kWh, and we multiply it by the cost. So it's 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Dimensional analysis, these go away. You're left with money. So we take that number there, multiply it by 0.12. So that cost is approximately $40,000 over the course of three months, which is quite the electric bill, isn't it? That takes care of the horsepower question. What we're going to do now is move on to inductors and capacitors. The schematic symbol for a capacitor looks like this, and the schematic symbol for inductor looks like a coil of wire. A capacitor is best described as two metal plates separated by a dielectric. An inductor could be described as a coil of wire. Know that both the inductor and capacitor are energy storage devices. The capacitor stores energy as electrostatic. The inductor stores energy as electromagnetic. The energy stored in a capacitor is described as one half multiplied by the capacitance by the voltage squared. The energy in an inductor is described as one half multiplied by the inductance by the current squared. Should know that this energy is in joules. And we said C was for capacitance. And L is for inductance. It's useful to draw a picture showing how the energy is stored in each device. A capacitor is constructed as two metal plates separated by dielectric. Now, dielectric in this case means insulator. So what will happen is charge will build up on either plate. Because the dielectric is an insulator, those charges cannot recombine. They can only recombine if you were to connect the capacitor into a circuit and allow a path for current to flow. The inductor typically includes a core made out of electrical steel. Onto that core, we will find many turns of wire. As current flows through the wire, it will establish a magnetic field in the core. 
it is that magnetic field which stores the energy in the inductor. In a capacitor, the energy is stored as the attraction of charge across the dielectric. And in the inductor, it is the magnetic field that contains the energy. There's a rule with energy that we need to understand. We're going to write that out. We're going to say note. We cannot have an instantaneous change in energy. As far as the capacitor is concerned, that means we cannot change the charge on the plates instantaneously. Another way of saying that is you can't change the voltage on a capacitor quickly. The inductor has energy stored in the magnetic field, but that magnetic field was the result of current flowing in the wire. So it stands to reason that you can't change the current in an inductor instantaneously. Another way of saying that same thing is a rule of thumb. You could look at it this way. You could say capacitors tend to keep the voltage constant. And just the opposite for inductors. The inductors tend to keep the current constant. If you wanted to get really fussy, we could talk about calculus. We could talk about the current on a capacitor is the capacitance by the change in voltage per unit time. And for the inductor, we could talk about the voltage is equal to the inductance by the change in current over the change in time. If your calculus is a bit rusty, or if this is the first time you've seen this, we can talk about dV dt as a change in voltage over a change in time. Or if we want to spell that out, it's a change of voltage over a change in time. All right, let's backtrack and see if this makes any sense. So we made this rather cryptic note that said, you may not have an instantaneous change in energy. Okay. So for a capacitor, that would mean an instantaneous charging of the capacitor. So let's see what happens. To charge a capacitor instantaneously means that dV dt, the change in voltage or change in unit time, is very high. If dV dt is high, you'll find that current is also high. So even if you wanted to instantaneously charge a capacitor, you couldn't because chances are you're never going to have enough current to do it. It's a similar story with the inductor. You cannot have an instantaneous change in energy. Recall that the energy in an inductor is stored in this magnetic field. That magnetic field is a function of the current flowing through the inductor. So if you tried to increase the current very quickly, you would find that you couldn't because you never have enough voltage in order to do it. So there's always a limit to how fast you can store energy. Let's work an example and see if we can make more sense of this. For this example, you're given a 10 millihenry inductor, and you're told that the current goes from zero to two amps in one millisecond, and after that, it is constant. So our current goes from zero to two amps linearly in one millisecond. Okay, so this is time. And this is current. And we also said that after this point, the current is constant. And that's a T for time, not a plus. OK, well, that's this equation right here. So knowing that, we would say that the voltage is equal to the inductance, in this case, 0 0.1 Henry's. DI, that's the change or the difference in current. And that is, in this case, 2 amps over the change in time. And the change in time is 1 millisecond, so 0 0.001. 
And if we do that, we see the voltage is 0 0.01 times 2 divided by 0 0.001. So that's 20 volts. If you were to graph that, you would see that as a function of time, the voltage jumps up to 20 volts, stays there. Right? The voltage jumps up to 20 volts, stays constant until this point here, at which case it drops back down to zero. So the voltage is the inductance multiplied by the change of current for change of time. So right here we have a change in current over a change in time that's linear. For this section, the change in current per unit time is zero, which is why we drop down to zero here. Okay, so again, at this point you would say di dt is equal to zero, and at this point you would say di dt is equal to 2 over 1 millisecond. If we want to have a little more fun with this, we go back here and we say that there was some energy stored in that inductor. Right? So there's energy. And that energy was a function of the current. So hold that equation in your mind. And we're going to go back to our problem. If we can find it here. So energy equals one half L I squared. So we could make a chart. We could talk about time, talk about current, and we could talk about energy. Let's pick a few data points, including zero milliseconds which is this point right there. We would say the current is zero amps. We may as well use this value right here. That's half a millisecond. And we see the current is one amp there. And then we'll pick this data point here. So that's one millisecond with a current of two amps. And we may as well do one more right here. We'll call that 1.5 milliseconds and the current is still two amps. So now if we solve for energy, if there's no current, there's no energy, the energy at time equal 0.5 milliseconds is 0.5 times 0 0.01 times one times one. So the energy is five millijoules We can calculate the energy at time equal one millisecond now. So that's one half times, again, there's the inductance, 10 millihenries. 0 0.01 times two times two. And that is 20 millijoules. And at 1.5, it's the same as well. It's 20 millijoules. You can see that this is not linear, but we didn't expect it to be because we have a current squared value there. If we were to plot this curve, it would look like this. At time zero, there's zero energy. At time one half millisecond, so this is time, and we'll let this be milliseconds. This is millijoules. We would see that the energy is like that. At time one millisecond, so one millisecond, we would see that this has increased from five to twenty. So we're increasing very quickly here. So this was five millijoules and this was twenty millijoules. But be careful. Our original problem said that we level off after one millisecond the current stops increasing. And if that's true, that means at this point here, the energy stored in the inductor stops increasing, which is what we reflect with that particular point right there. If the current in the inductor is not changing, that means the energy stored is also not changing.
Let's work a capacitor example. We'll assume a 310 farad capacitor, and we'll assume a constant 2 amp charge. And the question is, find the time to reach 2.7 volts DC. That's actually describing this capacitor right here. It is, maybe you can make that out, 310 farads. And it has a working voltage of 2.7 volts DC. So what we want to know is how long will it take to charge this capacitor to 2.7 volts when we only have a 2 amp constant current source to do it. Going back, we should find our equations. So that's this equation here. So we would say that the current is equal to the capacitance by dV dt. Plugging our values in, 2 amps is equal to 310. We're looking for a change in voltage of 2.7 over a change in time. So we're looking for dt, which is a change in time. We can solve for that as 2 divided by 310 divided by 2.7 equals, and then we invert that, and we find that dt is equal to about 419, in this case it would be seconds. And if you divide that by 60, that works to be about 7 minutes. Graphically, it looks like this. As a function of time, we are going to apply a constant current of 2 amps, and it'll take about 7 minutes. In that time, the voltage on the capacitor increases linearly. And then we get at 7 minutes. And after that, the voltage on the capacitor will be steady. Once again, we can plot this. We have time, voltage, we have energy, and we'll pick a few values here. We'll go time zero, we'll go 3.5 minutes, and seven minutes. Corresponding to here, here, and here. At time zero, the voltage was zero. At three and a half minutes, we're halfway charged, so we'll call it 1.35 volts. And at seven minutes, we are fully charged at 2.7 volts. The energy is zero. By the way, the energy on a capacitor, I think this is already on your note card, energy is equal to the capacitance by the voltage squared. So we come over here and we say 0.5 times the capacitance, 310 times 1.35 by 1.35. So we have an energy of 282 joules. And then we can do the other one here as well. So we say 0 0.5 times 310 times 2.7 times 2.7. gives us about 1,130 joules. Except joules is kind of a difficult number. Why don't we do one more conversion? So this was energy in joules. Let's do energy in watt hours. Here's the equation you want. 3,600 joules is equal to one watt hour. Okay, so keep that one. So zero is to zero. Um, if you have 282 joules, we would say that 3600 joules is to one watt hour. And if you solve for that, you would say 282 divided by 3600 gives you about 0 0.078 watt hours. And finally, we can take care of this one here. So 1130 divided by 3600 
and that is 0 0.31 watt hours. And the plot of that data looks like this, where we steadily increase that energy up to a point of 0 0.31 watt hours, and then we level off at time is equal to seven minutes. Again, just to recap, we have these equations that describe the voltage and current relationships on a capacitor and an inductor. And you can see that those very much depend on how fast something is changing. The current on a capacitor is a function of how fast you're trying to change the voltage. The voltage on an inductor is a question of how fast you're trying to change the current. What else did we have? These equations here describe the energy that is stored on an inductor or a capacitor. One final thing, and then we are done for the day. Inductors and capacitors are just like resistors in that you can combine them into series and parallel circuits. For instance, here's three inductors. We'll let that be one Henry, three Henrys, and five Henrys. This one's really simple because the rule for inductors is the same as the rule for resistors. So the total inductance in this circuit is one plus three plus five which gives you a total inductance of nine Henrys. If the inductors were installed in a circuit like this, we'll let this be two Henrys, four Henrys, and three Henrys. We would say the total inductance is one over two plus one over four plus one over Three. We've done that with resistors quite a few times. That gives us a total inductance of approximately 900 millihenries. Capacitors in series parallel are close but different. For example, if you have capacitors in a circuit like this, and if you let that be nine microfarads, five microfarads and eight microfarads, the total capacitance would be like so, which means the total capacitance is equal to nine inverse plus five inverse plus eight inverse equals, let me invert that. So that's about 2.3 microfarads. And our last circuit looks something like this. If you have capacitors in parallel, and we let this be five microfarads, let this one be seven microfarads and nine microfarads, you calculate total capacitance as the sum of the capacitance. So five plus seven plus nine gives you 21 microfarads. One thing to remember, we said we are on the transition from direct current to alternating current. And alternating current means that things are always changing. We saw that when we talked about DIDT. So it's the change of current over time. We talked about DVDT, how fast is a voltage changing Per time. Very soon we are going to talk about sinusoids, in which case things are always changing as we progress through time. It'll take us a few lectures to get there, but I think you see where this is going. If you have an alternating current source and you connect up a resistor and an inductor, 
We know that this inductor is going to store energy in the magnetic field. This raises some interesting questions because you have the source, which is the source of the energy. There's going to be a current flowing in this circuit. We have a resistor that's converting electrical energy into heat. And then we have the inductor that's storing the energy in its magnetic field. But in the end, it's still Ohm's law, KVL, KCL, and all the other properties that we learned about in DC.